Amen. Thank you, Lee. And I think it should be a rule that when your child is baptized, you have to sing the offertory. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? You did awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, but before we turn our Bibles to Matthew 3, and we're going to go there in just a second, I have to tell you something. I was literally preparing this passage on the camel's hair and the locust this week, and I was walking from one building to the other, came into my study, and here is this amazing-sized locust on the door going into the church, and I thought to myself, now that has to be a sign. So I grabbed it with my hand, and I brought it for you this morning, and I was wondering if anybody would be willing to just says, eat this. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sean Sanborn, everybody, our, uh, our missionary, is going to... Before, do you, Does anyone else want to go? Anyone else want this? <laughs> Sean has fried this up for us this morning to give us a little bit of a... Of a okay, what's going on here? take the, the legs off here first. Okay. Oh, hi, Samantha. Oh, did, did you, do you, okay? you don't want this, do you? No. Are you going to eat it or am I going to eat it? <laughs> I guess I'm going to eat it. All right, here he goes. You ready? Mm, French fries. Let's go. So he took off the legs. If anyone wants those, see Sean Sanborn after church. Thank you, Sean. Very good. Well, hey, let's grab our Bibles, and we're going to go now to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. Uh, we're going to actually jump around a little bit today, so try to follow me if you can. Uh, let's stand up for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to look at verses 4 to 6 here in this chapter, and then we're going to jump to a little bit later in Matthew. So let's listen to the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now let's flip over to Matthew chapter 11. I just want to pick up a couple more verses that we're going to talk about later. Matthew chapter 11, let's look at 7 to 10. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women... There has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we've already even seen a, a covenant family baptism uh, with the Fernandezes. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are still, even now, setting apart people for yourself, setting them apart from the world and unto yourself for your glory. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that even as I preach this morning the word, that your Holy Spirit would be alive and at work. We know he's alive. We pray he would be at work here in our midst, saving and confirming and consecrating and sanctifying the people of God, that we may serve you with heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Well, uh, the last time I played basketball was in seventh grade, and I moved then next year to the world's oldest and greatest sport, which is wrestling. Uh, but the reason I, I changed from basketball to wrestling is that something terrible happened to me that seventh grade year of basketball. Uh, what happened to me that was so terrible is that the Nike Jordan Air Number 4 shoes came out that year, and you say to yourself, well, why is that so terrible? Well, uh, the reason why that was so terrible for me in my seventh grade year is that I knew for a fact that there was no way that I was going to be able to afford those shoes. I came from a really working class family. My dad worked at nights at a grocery store, and he worked in the days as a land surveyor's assistant. He worked his tail off all the time, but there was an X factor that year. My mom had just had a major hip surgery, a major hip replacement, 
And so we were just kind of struggling to make ends meet. And when the Nike Jordan Air Force came out, I knew I wasn't even going to ask my parents for these shoes. I wouldn't even ask. I wasn't even going to beg. I wasn't going to cry. I wasn't going to even name the name Nike Air Jordans. I was just going to get whatever shoes my mom would get me for the year. And so we went to the Pickway shoe sale outlet. Do, you know, do they have those around here, Pickways? Is that a place still? It wasn't up in Ohio. It was one of those stores where all the shoes are already out. They're in racks. All you have to do is you go to your size and they had about five different options, and the only option for me was these all-white, bright white, off-brand shoes, and the Jordans were black and red, and when Michael Jordan wore them, this is the days where the Bulls were amazing. Uh, he hit the shot back in those days. This is 1989. Jordan would float to the rim like a Jedi Knight or something in these black and red shoes, and my only choice was these white, bright white, off-brand shoes, and when I showed up to the practice court, I might as well have been wearing clown shoes. I might, literally, I might as well, as well have been wearing those snowshoes that look like big tennis rackets. You know what I'm talking about that they wear in Alaska? Might as well have had those on. My whole year, I was afraid that people were going to call me out, make fun of my shoes. My coach even mentioned them one time. I still to this day, I don't know if he was mocking them or if he was complimenting. I really don't even know. I spent the year on the bench with my feet kind of back against the bench. I put my bag on top of them, and I was just praying that God would not make me go out onto the court and actually have to wear those white shoes when everybody on the team had the black Air Jordan number fours. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been uh, forced to feel the pressure of conformity? Of course, we all have. The pressure of conformity. Have you ever been forced by the social pressures around you to do something, wear something, say something, think something, because everybody else is doing it? Well, of course, We've all felt that pressure. That pressure of conformity is relentless. It is everywhere. It seems to follow us like a shadow, no matter how old we are, uh, whether we grow up from the basketball court, whether we go to the college classroom, whether we make it to the professional realm in the boardroom, the pressure to conform is always upon us, all right? And you feel it, and I feel it, and uh, most of the time, the social pressure to conform actually will tear us apart rather than making us strong. Now, the pressure of conformity actually comes from a pretty good desire, all right? The pressures of conformity come from a place in our heart where we want to be loved, we want to be accepted, we want people to like us, we want to have unity with the people around us. But the problem is this, without the Spirit of God working in our lives, uh, to uphold us and to make us firm and strong in our convictions. Without the Spirit of God, what happens is the pressures of conformity normally end up tearing us apart. And so it's really the same pressure that will, for instance, cause one person to join a street gang, all right, and another person to join a cult. It's the same pressure of conformity. It's the pressure of conformity that will cause one person to destroy their body by injecting illicit drugs into their bloodstream. And it's that same pressure of conformity that will drive somebody else into bulimia or anorexia just so they can get into one dress size smaller than they already are. It's that pressure of conformity that'll cause one person on the higher scale of academia to plagiarize their doctoral dissertation and that same pressure of conformity will cause somebody else to drop out of school in eighth grade. You see what I'm saying? The pressures of conformity are everywhere. They're already working upon you. The question isn't what, yes or no, whether or not you feel it. The question is, how well will you resist the pressures of conformity? Some people, even, even mild-mannered, normal, suburban folks like us, are driven by conformity to sell ourselves into ungodly debt so that we can sustain certain levels of apparent accomplishment and lifestyle so we can fit in all around us. Meanwhile, we're being pulled apart by by debt, all of this is tearing us apart, and my question is why? Why is it that some people, and they're very rare, can resist 
the pressures of conformity, but most of us are pulled away by the wayside like gravity just constantly tearing us down. What is it about some people that they refuse to conform? Well, that's why uh, we're studying John the Baptist, and that's why I think he's such a relevant character for us to study in the scriptures in this day and time and age, uh, because these pressures aren't going away. But John the Baptist somehow seems to have the antidote for the pressures of conformity. Have you ever noticed that when you've studied his life? Have you ever noticed that John the Baptist doesn't seem to cave in to the pressures to be anybody but the person that the Lord called him to be? He seems to be resistant. How does he do it? Well, if you missed last week, uh, we gave a, bare, a very basic overview to the life and ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, he was a cousin of the Lord Jesus Christ by birth. Uh, he was filled with the Spirit from a very young age, as we're going to see. Uh, he had a unique place in redemption history as the last Old Testament prophet and the first uh, New Testament gospel evangelist, and so he has a very unique calling. Uh, last week I gave you three Ds, his domain. Do you remember this? was the wilderness. His destiny was greatness, and his duties were that of a servant, all right? And so today what we're going to do is we're going to advance uh, our study on John the Baptist a little bit. And my question is, what is it that enables us to resist the powers of conformity? I'll give you the answer in one word and then I'll define it. You ready? Holiness. Say that with me one time. Holiness. Now let me get to a definition of holiness and then I'm going to break it down. Holiness is comprised of two perspectives, or we might say attributes. They are, number one, being set apart from the world. Now, that's a negative way to say it, but holiness is being removed from the pressures and drives of worldliness, all right? That's the negative way. Now, you can say that same thing positively, and I would say it like this. Holiness, therefore, is being set apart unto, I like that word, or set apart for what? For the Lord. So that's the positive way of saying it. And let's dig into our Bibles, and I want to show you both of these in turn. So uh, let's go back to that Matthean passage, chapter 3. Let's look at verse 4. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And by the way, Sean... You know, he's a missionary, so that's not, that's not too tough. You've probably eaten worse than that, haven't you? All kinds of things on the mission field he's eaten. Uh, but even in this day, in the ancient world, uh, to dress in camel's hair and to eat locusts is kind of unusual, bizarre behavior, all right? Uh, locusts were eaten, yes, uh, but they were typically the food of, of the poor. They're still eaten, by the way, in many places around the world today. They're filled with protein, so there you go, a little diet tip. Uh, but certainly to dress in camel's hair in, in John the Baptist's day was not normal. If it was normal, why would the evangelists even mention it? Why would they even bring it up if it was something that normal people did? No, uh, normal people in the first century A.D., they wore very light, very loose-fitting fabrics, uh, typically fabrics of a lighter color that would not draw in the heat of the sun. Uh, they would wear loose-fitting garments that allowed the breeze to move through. They did not typically wear uh, the unshaved or, or garments of thick leather with the hair still on them. So why in the world would, would John the Baptist do this? Well, and there's actually a couple of answers uh, to that question. And the first of all is simply that uh, John the Baptist, and you need to understand, throughout his ministry has a very deep identification with the prophet Elijah from the Old Testament on a number of levels. As you begin to study the life of John the Baptist, you're going to notice that the name Elijah keeps coming up because John the Baptist is, uh, in a sense, carrying on the duties and the power of Elijah's prophetic ministry in his day. And so we're not surprised when I turn to 2 Kings chapter 1, and it says this, listen, about Elijah. It says, they answered him, he wore a garment of hair and a belt of leather around his waist, and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So that's uh, clearly a parallel between John and John. And Elijah, John the Baptist, is deeply identifying with the prophetic ministry of Elijah such that even the clothes that he wears is a sign. It's a sign pointing to his ministry, 
to his message. But there's probably another reason as well that John the Baptist uh, wears this camel hair, this leather belt, probably very rough hewn around his waist while he's, he's popping uh, locusts like they're, uh, like they're hard candy or something like that. Why is he doing this? Because John the Baptist is giving a very clear signal. I'm not one of you. I'm not one of you. John the Baptist is making a very clear sign. I do not belong to the system uh, of worldliness. I do not think, I do not act, I do not carry myself as the rest of the world does. I am not another of the religious hypocrites like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribe. I'm different. I'm set apart. And church, um, listen, let me, let me give it to you straight this morning. And if you don't know that the unbelieving world is intentionally pressuring us to conform, then we're simply naive because it's everywhere. The pressure of the unbelieving world uh, to force us into conformity in everything is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It is almost impossible to resist the power of conformity. They want us to buy the products that they want us to buy. They want us to dress in the styles that they want us to dress, but it goes deeper than that. They want us to believe the things that they believe, uh, to leave behind the morals that we've established, to leave behind the ethical teachings of the Bible. And if you don't understand that the world is pressuring even Bible-believing Christians like us to conform, then we're simply naive. Uh, they want us on a conveyor belt. They want us being rolled off one after another so that they can stamp us with their values and their mores and their ethics and their system and their thoughts and their doctrines. And they want us rolled off like a conveyor belt, stamping us one after the another after another in the same image of conformity that everybody else is stamped with. And if you don't believe that, did you notice what the White House did a couple of weeks ago on the day of the Supreme Court decision? Did you notice that? Okay, but there's something scarier than that. I, I'm not surprised when the executive branch uh, makes political statements. But what caught me off guard was the very same day, did you know that the Department of Education actually changed their Facebook page officially to have the same logo behind their name? Did you know that? To me, that's scarier. The Department of Education, do you think they're neutral in matter, matters of morality? Do you think they're neutral in matters of human sexuality? If you do, uh, let me tell you, I think that's naive. The pressures of conformity are everywhere. How many of you remember uh, the Pink Floyd song, Another Brick in the Wall? Remember that? There you go. I've been here seven years. Uh, I've never made a Pink Floyd reference yet, so this is going to be the record here at Faith Church, my first pink, and no, that's not my favorite band, but do you remember the song, Another Brick in the Wall? Have you ever seen the video for that song? It is, you're probably going to YouTube it later. It is goofy, it is ridiculous, it is silly, uh, but it does make a strong point. It depicts a, uh, a British, uh, some kind of school, some kind of, uh, I don't know, live-in school, they all have the same uniforms on, and all the, all the children are on a, the same path. They're all on this conveyor belt. They're all wearing exactly the same clothes. They all have masks obscuring their face to remove their individuality. And the video is just so goofy. At the end of the video, they're dropping into this, this kind of meat grinder and they're, and they're making sausage out of these school kids. And you know, you remember the lyrics to the song, we don't need no education. We don't need no what? Thought control. And, and as stupid as the video is, listen, let me say something really serious about it. The war on holiness is fought for the, for the battleground of the mind. You tracking with me on that? The war of holiness is fought on the battleground of the mind. And here's why. Because the mind is the front door to the soul. As a man thinks... So he is. And so if the mind is the front door to the soul and to the inner parts of who we are and our hearts, then education is like the front porch which lead, leads us to the door. And so the battle is very much around uh, the Christian mind, but that's not the only place that the battle is being waged. And now I'm going to get a little bit personal with a lot of you today. Do you know, parents, how many hours 
the average child spends screening every day. Do you know what I mean by the word screening? You, are you familiar with that term? Okay, screening is when your child is sitting in front of a computer screen or a television screen or a tablet screen or a phone screen or whatever video game, handheld system screen. Screening is the way young people are being raised today. Let me give you some statistics. Uh, this is from an article recently in the New York Times, and here it is. Uh, this is just for kids all the way across uh, the board. Uh, for children that are, uh, let's see, 8 to 10 years old, number of hours every day, you want to guess? Let's have some fun here. Four, seven, it's eight hours a day screening. Okay. Now, if you're a teenager, it goes up dramatically. It goes from eight hours a day to 11 hours a day. I wasn't even awake 11 hours a day when I was a teenager, were you? <laughs> okay, so this is screening. And what I want to do is I'm going to give you just a visual. Uh, this sermon's a little bit more topical than exegetical. I hope you'll bear with me on this. Let me just give you a visual. So do the math with me. If, if you spend seven days a week, and let's just say 10 hours a day screening, how many hours of screening is that per week? That's 70 hours. Now, let's just assume that this child who's screening 70 hours does one thing a week. They come to church. That's it. They come to church every week. Mom and dad is faithful. That's it. All right? So what's their ratio then of world to word? 70 to 1. And so here's what that looks like. That's, that's a sliver of the word of God versus the worldly influence. And so that big blue chunk of the pie, that represents 70 hours of SpongeBob and Miley Cyrus and MTV and ridiculousness and YouTube and texting and Disney Channel and Candy Crush and Minecraft and Shark Week. I love Shark Week, right? Got to get me some Shark Week. Ariana Grande, Taylor Swift, Burger King commercials, Facebook promoted ads, Snapchats, mail supplement ads during professional sports, E! News. My question to you is this. Does that chart represent, in any definition of the word, holiness? How could it? It's anything but. And that's a family that goes to church and brings her kid for one hour a week. There you go. Now, let's be fair. A lot of you don't do that. You don't allow that in your home, okay? Uh, what you do is maybe you cut that screen time down in half. Let's say it's five hours a day. Let's cut it in half. And let's instead amplify the number of hours that a child would get with the Word of God. Let's say that they come to church and they come to Sunday school. Are you doing that, right? And, and youth groups on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and you're doing family devotions four nights a week, 15 minutes, and you have at least two good heart-to-heart, -heart, half an hour talks every week. Uh, you are doing the best you can as a parent. Let's call that seven hours of influence of the Word of God. Now our ratio is 35 to 7. Here's what the pie graph looks like now. You like that? Best case scenario. That's the power of the, wor the world's influence to shape the Christian mind, and it is everywhere. So, how did John the Baptist resist? Well, let me answer that at least a little bit. And part of that is what we, we've seen already this morning with the baptism of Joel Fernandez. All right? John the Baptist was raised from day one to be holy unto the Lord. This is key. He was raised from day one to be holy unto the Lord. Now, when the angel spoke at John the Baptist's birth, uh, he said that John the Baptist would be separated from the world, that he would not drink wine or the fruit of the, the vine, etc. Uh, that's in Luke chapter 1. What is that a reference to? Well, that, that's kind of a strange thing to say when a child is born, don't let him drink wine. What, what is that? Well, that's probably a reference to the Old Testament Nazarite vow, which we find in Numbers chapter 6. I want you to turn your Bible with me to the Old Testament uh, let's look at Numbers chapter 6, and I want to show you this vow that most likely was spoken over John the Baptist, and he was raised differently, all right? From day one, this, John the Baptist is raised different. Now, let me say this about the Nazarite vow. It is not mandatory. It was optional. 
A Nazarite vow was not forced upon anybody, but it was something that could be an option. In fact, for many people in the Bible, including Paul, it would be a vow that you would take upon your life for a certain period of time. One month, one season, one year, whatever. John the Baptist was raised as a Nazarite. The very Hebrew word nazer uh, means set apart or holy. And so let's look at this. It says in chapter 6, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. There's one. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. So not even grapes, not even raisins is what the Bible says, right? All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins, verse 5. And all the days of the vows of his separation, no razor shall be upon his head. And until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord, he shall be, here's our word, what? Holy. He shall let the locks of his hair, the locks of his hair of his head grow long, verse 6. And all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body, not even for his father or his mother or his brother or sister, If they die, he shall make himself unclean because his separation to God is on his head. All of the days of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. Now, there's three things there. There's the grape juice, wine, raisin stuff. Uh, There's the no shaving or the cutting of the hair stuff. And then there's the no touching of the dead body stuff. And you say, well, that sounds kind of random, doesn't it? Well, a lot of times in the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament works through types and shadows. And so let me just, let me just allegorize a bit. Now, don't do this on your own, but I'm just going to allegorize just a little bit here. It seems to me that the wine, alcohol, drunkenness says something about holiness of the mind. Do you think? It seems to me that the no razor, no cutting of the hair thing may have something to do with the body. Doesn't it seem like that? Maybe, I don't know, bodily purity, maybe something to do with our sexuality or the way that we we serve with our hands and feet and minds. Uh, And what about the dead body thing? Well, certainly in the Old Testament, uh, the the dead body was a symbol of death. Uh, It was a symbol of sin and being separated from God. And so if you put that together, uh, what we have here is a Nazarite is somebody, in my view, who is holy unto the Lord in mind, in body, and in spirit. And by the way, before we go on, adults, everything I said about the screening applies to you. It's not a kid thing. The mind is the battlefield. That's number one, separated from the world. Now, let's hurry up and move on to to number two, because time is fleeting this morning. Uh, But secondly, I do want to mention the fact that uh, when somebody is holy, they're not just separated from the world. Because otherwise we would just all go and flee to uh, ivory, ivory towers and just get out of town. But that's not exactly it. There's another compartment that goes with this, and that is that a holy person is one who is set apart for, or actually like the word, unto the Lord. Now let's look at Luke chapter 1 here. Luke chapter 1, and we've got to move quickly, t- folks. Time is, is moving this morning. Luke chapter 1. Again, I want to mention the words that the angel spoke when John the Baptist was born. The angel said to Zechariah, his father, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. I'm in verse 15, if you're following. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. There's that Nazarite reference I mentioned earlier. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And now to say it positively, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. 
Okay, so holiness is not just getting away from the world. It's also serving the Lord. It's, it's also using your life as a witness and as a testimony for the glory of God and for the good of his people. And I'm going to give uh, Chris Carpenter over there five points at the staff meeting uh, because as we did our Bible study this week, we always study the passage together. Chris said uh, something very wise. He said, you know, one of the effects of holiness is generational. You know what he means by that? One of the effects of holiness is that holiness tends to spread in a really positive way. Holiness tends to move from one generation to the next. When you have a father that loves Jesus and loves the Bible and loves the church, what what tends to happen is that fathers tend to raise children that love Jesus and love the Bible and love the church. And so if you want a child that is going to be resistant to the powers of conformity, uh, one of the first things I would tell you is, Dad... Ready? Dad, do your job. Mom, do your job. Because look, uh, I mean, what, what did we just read? It says, John the Baptist, his ministry, verse 16, Luke 1, he will turn many of the children of Israel, what, to the Lord their God, and, 17, the hearts of the fathers to where? To the children. So look, when you have a family that is working together for the glory of God, they're reading their Bibles, they're praying things out, they're talking about important issues, they're talking about sexuality, they're talking about the stresses and pressures of peer pressure, they're doing Bible together, they're having devotions, they're praying before meals, not just bless the food, but Lord, God, we we implore you, Heavenly Father, when family and church are working together in concert, then what do you get? Then you get a generation of people who are resistant to the forces of the world because at that point, we're raising a generation of John the Baptist. You tracking with me? Okay, so holiness isn't just about don't drink and smoke and chew and date the girls who do, as they used to say. Holiness is being set apart for the Lord. The very word in the Bible, holy, is usually in reference to someone or something having a special usage, a special function, a a special practice, a special job. And so think about it. You've got the Sabbath is called the holy day because it's set apart for the Lord. You've got the most holy place in the temple that's set apart because that's where the Spirit of God would manifest himself in power. All right? Uh, you've got uh, the holy garments even for Aaron and the priests. I mean, my goodness, the whole idea is, of holiness is that somebody or something would have a special usage to glorify a God, a set-apart way, just like you have china in your cupboards, don't you? You have china that you pull out only once in a while when the special guests show up and you want to make a special meal that's been especially prepared. You don't pull out the china every week when you get Taco Bell on the way home from church. And we are the Lord's china that he sets apart for his special usages for his special witness in the midst of an unbelieving world. Let me give you a couple Bible verses. All right, told you this is going to be topical today. Hebrews 12. I'll I'll say them faster than you can go, so just listen. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Wow. 2 Corinthians 7. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Do you understand why we're so particular about our views on sexuality? Okay, the world just thinks we're old-fashioned. The world just mocks us. Uh, uh, We're haters, we're bigots, we're this, we're that. We won't change, we won't get with the times, we won't catch up to date. No, it's a matter of being holy unto the Lord. The reason that we believe uh, that sex is to be reserved for marriage is because marriage is a sacred union. 
Uh, We see holiness in these things. We don't see the body as something to be thrown around all over the place. We see the body designed for holiness. Let me give you one more. 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. So, what's the deal with the locusts and and the camel's hair? Yes, holiness is visible, but it goes far deeper in our lives than what we wear. Do you all understand that? If holiness was a matter of wearing the right garment, we could all go to the thrift store right now and get some John Travolta 70s get up uh, with hair on it or something like that, and we would be holy, but it's deeper than that. Uh, If holiness was about eating a bug, we would all choke one down and get saved today, but that's not how it works. Holiness goes down deeper than the service level. You understand? It goes deeper from the surface into the values of the person, into the morals of the person, into the thinking of the person, and all the way down to the very core of who we are. Is God the Lord in our lives or is he not? That's the question. And so let me just wrap up with, with one thought here. You know what's interesting about John the Baptist? Then I'll I'll conclude with this. You ever notice in the New Testament how often it seems that John is confused with Jesus and Jesus is confused with John? You ever notice that? Why is that? Because holiness is another way of saying Christ-likeness in our lives. To be holy is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when John the Baptist had his preaching ministry, he had to say it over and over again, I'm not the Christ. (laughs) He's coming, but I'm not him. And they they wanted to think, hey, you seem like a Christ-like guy. I'm not the Christ, he says, John 1. And then later in Matthew's gospel, chapter 16, uh, Jesus asks a really important question. You remember this? He says, hey, who do the crowds say I am? What's what's the scoop? What what are they saying about me out there on the streets? And what do the disciples say to Jesus? Well, some think you're John the Baptist or one of the prophets. And Peter says, yeah, but we know you're the Christ. Isn't that interesting that they would confuse John with Jesus and Jesus with John? (laughs) Anybody here ever been confused with Jesus before? (laughs) Is your life different? Are you set apart? Are you divergent? Or are you being squeezed into the mold that the world would have you be conformed to? Let's pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you today in in desperation, really. Lord, the pressures are everywhere. Every time we we turn on a a screen in our home or, or, Lord forbid, we hand one over to a small child. Lord, every time we turn on a screen, the the world is shaping the mind. And Lord, on, on one hand, that terrifies me because in so many ways, we are exactly like everybody else. And yet my hope, Lord, is that by the power of your Spirit, you would be preserving and sanctifying and setting apart and consecrating not only us here at Faith Church, but Christians all over the world. May you be setting us apart for your glory and for your honor. May the world laugh at us. May the world point the finger at us. Lord, may we be as obnoxious to them as a man who wears camel hair. But Lord, may we be beloved by you and honorable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Had a lot more to say about that, but we're going to get to it. Uh, Would you stand as we close out this morning? I want to pray a a blessing on you as you go. I want to thank you for worshiping with us here at Faith Church. We love you. We're glad you're here. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and your families and your children. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you. Thanks for being here. Have a great week.